What's up guys? So if you've been listening to the podcast or the YouTube videos, then you've probably heard our latest lecture on influenza. Last week we talked about how these patients will present, what imaging studies and lab tests to consider ordering, and how do we treat these patients. So today we're going to be building on last week's lecture and continuing to talk about influenza. So if you happen to miss last week's lecture, go ahead and make sure you listen to that first before you listen to today's. So if you remember from last week, we spoke about what subset of patients are considered to be at higher risk for complications secondary to influenza, and we came up with a mnemonic season of influenza to help us remember these individuals who are considered to be at higher risk. However, in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about just what complications can occur. Briefly, let's go over the mnemonic once again, season of influenza, to refresh your memory. However, keep in mind it is explained in more detail in the prior podcast and YouTube video. The first S stands for simply being pregnant. E stands for endocrine, such as the poorly controlled diabetic. A stands for adults, greater than or equal to 65 years of age. S stands for sickle cell. O stands for obesity with a BMI greater than 40. N stands for nursing home residents. And the of is silent in the mnemonic season of influenza, and it stands for nothing. The I stands for immunosuppression. N stands for Native American and Alaska Natives. F stands for filthy old cardiovascular disease, such as the patient who has congestive heart failure, and they already have three to four pillow orthopnea at night, and some shortness of breath at baseline, and maybe they're on two liters of oxygen chronically at home. L stands for lung disease, like COPD or cystic fibrosis. U stands for underlying chronic kidney disease or chronic liver disease, and E stands for exposed active cancer. N stands for any neurological condition that compromises the patient's ability to handle their own secretions, such as someone that might have underlying mental retardation, Alzheimer's, or uncontrolled seizures. Z stands for zona fasciculata, which makes up the middle layer of the adrenal cortex and is stimulated by the adrenocorticotropic hormone to produce glucocorticoids. Mainly, it's going to produce cortisol. So in knowing this, we need to ask our patients if they're taking exogenous glucocorticoids, such as prednisone, that could suppress the patient's immune system. And A stands for asthma. So most of the time, guys, the flu is usually going to be a self-limited infection, and patients are gradually going to improve over a two- to five-day period. Although their symptoms can last for one week or more, and some patients are going to have persistent symptoms of weakness or just get easily tired with minor activity, which this is more commonly referred to as post-influenza asthenia and may last for several weeks. However, complications of influenza can occur in any patient who has the flu and typically will happen in those individuals with one or more risk factors in our mnemonic season of influenza, which we just spoke about. Now, there are multiple complications that can occur from influenza, some of which are more common than others. And if you haven't figured this out by now, I like mnemonics. So, of course, I made up another one for you guys. You can remember the multiple complications of influenza that can occur by the mnemonic Crocs. That's like the shoe and it's spelled C-R-O-C-S, where the first C stands for cardiac complications. The R stands for rhabdomyolysis and myositis. The O stands for other rare complications, such as toxic shock syndrome. The second C stands for central nervous system complications, and the S stands for a secondary pneumonia. So now let's talk about each one of these complications that can occur in more detail. And while I usually like to talk about the more common things first, I think it'll be easier to remember the various complications if we just go through each letter in our mnemonic Crocs starting from the beginning of the word. So remember, the first C stands for cardiac complications, and there have been multiple potential cardiac complications described in patients with influenza infections. For example, a large surveillance study published in the Journal of Infectious Disease in June 2011, looking at weekly clinical and laboratory influenza surveillance data, environmental temperature and humidity data, and accounts of myocardial infarction associated hospitalizations and death were obtained from England and Wales, as well as Hong Kong between 1998 in 2008. During this period from January 1999 through December 2008, 1,219,150 myocardial infarctions associated hospitalizations in England with an average of 2,421 myocardial infarction associated hospitalizations per week and it ranged between 2,112 between 2,578. Over that same period of time, there was 410,204 MI-associated deaths that were reported in England and Wales and ranging between 639 and 908 deaths per week. This data was then compared to weekly influenza surveillance data between 1999 and 2008, and it showed increases in both MI-associated hospitalizations and deaths that corresponded to periods of influenza activity. In addition, during the period from January 1998 through December 2008 in Hong Kong, there were 65,108 myocardial infarctions associated hospitalizations with an average of 110 per week 
and ranging between 97 and 126. During the same time period, there are 18,780 MI-associated deaths, with an average of 32 per week and ranging between 27 and 38. This data was also compared with influenza surveillance data and showed increases in both MI-associated hospitalizations and deaths, with a larger peak occurrence in the winter months and a smaller increase in the summer months. Now, in knowing the above, this study would lead one to believe that there's an association between population levels of influenza and MI-associated deaths and hospitalizations. Whether or not these increased cardiac events can be attributed to the influenza virus is unknown. So at best, based off this study, I would conclude that there is a possible association with cardiac events increasing in weeks of highest influenza activity. Now, there's some theories out there to possibly explain these increased cardiac events. And the thought is that systemic prothrombic and inflammatory effects of influenza may possibly acutely destabilize atherosclerotic plaques in individuals with underlying coronary artery disease leading to an MI. Now, as with all studies, there were some limitations to this one as well. For example, some of the influenza surveillance data in England and Wales was based off a clinical diagnosis of the flu without formal testing. It was compared to 50 general practices in England with objective testing, however, with nasal swabs in patients with flu-like symptoms and showed a similar percentage of the flu. But who's to say the flu wasn't clinically overdiagnosed without confirmatory testing? Another retrospective study published in the Journal of Infectious Disease in 2012 examined the relationship of intense influenza outbreak periods and rates of ischemic heart disease-related death and hospitalization in Maryland residents that were 50 years or older over a seven-year period. This study also found an increased rate ratio of 1.06 and 1.16 for ischemic heart disease-related hospitalizations and deaths during a period of intense influenza activity. Furthermore, another possible cardiac complication, which is generally expected to be rare, is myocarditis and pericarditis. However, there is one study which looked at fatal cases of influenza B infections. Of the 29 patients who had cardiac tissue available for histology, myocardial injury was identified in 20 out of these 29 patients. So that's 69%. And interesting enough, 10 of these patients had unmistakable myocarditis. However, no viral antigens were identified inside the myocardium, suggesting that the myocardial injury and the myocarditis that occurs is not a direct effect of the virus. The R stands for rhabdomyolysis and myositis. So we all know that myalgias are a common complaint in patients presenting with influenza. However, although myalgias are a prominent symptom in most cases of influenza, and mild to moderate muscle tenderness occurs frequently, representing symptoms of a viral myositis, these symptoms are often self-limited without any laboratory abnormalities suggestive of inflammation or necrosis of the muscles. True myositis, in which the patients will have extreme tenderness to the affected muscles to palpation, most commonly the legs, and which progresses to rhabdomyolysis with significant creatinine kinase elevations greater than five times the upper limit of normal, elevated transaminases, and myoglobinuria with accompanied renal dysfunction is uncommon, but it's a life-threatening complication to be aware of. So by no means does every patient who presents with flu-like symptoms and they're having muscle aches need to have an advanced workup with a muscle biopsy done or even blood work. However, in the right setting, let's say we have a five-year-old child who presents to you with a fever, upper respiratory symptoms of a dry cough, runny nose, and myalgias. The mother says that he was getting better and he was recently diagnosed with the flu, but then he woke up this morning and he wouldn't walk, and he was complaining of severe muscle tenderness. If they do walk, they will usually walk on their toes, because with dorsiflexion, they will get pain in their ankles. You might even also notice some swelling to the lower extremities. In addition, let's say there's reports of dark urine, which could be red or brown, and could indicate myoglobinuria. Then, in this case, I would say that this patient's presentation is highly consistent with the viral myositis, and I'd want to get a CBC with differential, a CMP, creatinine kinase, myoglobin, a PT, a PTT, and a urine analysis, making sure it has not progressed to rhabdomyolysis. O stands for other rare complications such as toxic shock syndrome. Staphylococcus aureus is commonly found on the skin and mucous membranes of about 30 to 50 percent of healthy adults and children. It's most commonly in the nares, on the skin, vagina, and rectum. This organism, it has the ability to multiply in tissues, produce multiple enzymes that cause inflammation and abscesses. It also has many strains which produce exotoxins and case reports reveal that it is possible to occur after influenza B infections. Cultures of respiratory secretions were performed in 8 out of 9 patients, and Staphylococcus aureus was isolated from all of them. Of the staph isolated, 7 of them were able to be tested for exotoxin production. 5 of these isolates produce toxic shock syndrome toxic 1. 1 of these isolates produce enterotoxin B. 
and one produced both toxic shock syndrome 1 and enterotoxin B. In addition, three of the nine patients had confirmed influenza B infections. So while this is a rare complication, it's possible. Of note, these patients' initial presentations were consistent with that of a viral pneumonia in eight of them, and the other one was consistent with a staph pneumonia. The second C in our mnemonic stands for central nervous system complications, with studies showing rare complications of influenza leading to encephalopathy, encephalitis, transverse myelitis, aseptic meningitis, and even Guillain-Barre syndrome. However, the pathogenesis of all these illnesses and their associations with influenza remains poorly understood. And finally, the last S stands for a secondary pneumonia. Pneumonia is going to be the major complication of influenza, and it's by far the most common. Now, there are three different types of pneumonia that can occur. You can have a primary viral influenza pneumonia, you can have a secondary bacterial pneumonia, or you can have a mixture of both. Now, if you remember from earlier, the flu is mainly a self-limiting viral upper respiratory infection. However, a primary viral influenza pneumonia can occur when the virus directly involves the lung. These patients will often present initially as a typical influenza infection. However, their symptoms are going to be constant, and they're going to get worse, not better. These patients are going to have a high fever, shortness of breath, and they may even be cyanotic. This is the most severe pneumonia, but it's the least common. It has an increased tendency to occur in individuals with increased left atrial pressure and chronic pulmonary disease. Other differentiating features to help you identify this as a primary viral pneumonia is that on the chest x-ray, you'll see bilateral reticular or reticular nodular opacities with or without some concomitant consolidation. Less often, the chest x-ray will just show focal areas of consolidation. Most likely, it's going to be in the lower lobes without reticular or reticular nodular opacity. A secondary bacterial pneumonia is going to be the most common type of pneumonia as a complication of influenza. But unlike the viral pneumonias, these patients are going to get better for one to two days at first, but then their fever will come back, their cost is going to increase with their sputum production, and now they're going to have evidence on chest x-ray of pulmonary infiltrates. The most common bacterial pathogen arising as a secondary complication from the flu is going to be streptococcus pneumoniae. However, staphylococcus aureus is an increasingly common cause of a secondary pneumonia as well. And then you have Haemophilus influenza, which also is a cause. Community-acquired methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus is also an important cause to note as well. But how does a secondary bacterial infection occur? Well, I want you to picture a 65-year-old man, and they've just been diagnosed with the flu. They presented to their family doctor with very mild presentation and they've been symptomatic for over 48 hours, and they're being treated with supportive therapy. They go home, and they're drinking their warm tea with honey, and they're taking their antipyretics for fever and their muscle aches. However, unbeknownst to him, when he was coughed on multiple times by his grandson, he inhaled a large number of influenza particles. And since we know from mouse models that higher levels of neuraminidase correlate with or allow increased adherence and evasion of streptococcus pneumonia, he's already in trouble. In addition, these viral neuramidases cleave salicylic acid from host cells in the upper respiratory tract and results in free sugar. This sugar can then be used by streptococcus colonies in the nasopharynx to replicate and grow. So what the heck does that all mean? Well, picture that guy once again who's 65 years old and he has the flu. Simply put, the flu is thought to allow for increased bacterial attachment sites in the nose and throat. So now the streptococcus pneumonia adhere or hold on better to the areas in the nose and throat. And the flu is thought to create a little bit extra sugar in the nose and throat for streptococcus pneumonia to grow big and strong. So if you didn't already know, streptococcus pneumonia is a part of our normal flora of our upper respiratory tract. It's hanging out in my nose right now, and it's not causing me any problems. And it's hanging out in the 65-year-old man's nose as well. So let's say when his grandson coughed on him, he also gave him a little bit of his streptococcus pneumonia out of his nose. And it takes a little bit of time for the flu to make those sugars to increase the colony size in our 65-year-old man. So the streptococcus pneumonia that's in this guy's nose begins to replicate, and it replicates. It eats a little bit more of that sugar. It grows a little bit stronger. It's adhering well to the nasomucosa, and this guy's nose is just so freaking congested. He has tons of postnasal drip, and that mucus from his nose is going back into his throat, stimulates his cough receptors, and he's just coughing it up, coughing up purulent sputum. Well, let's say he also smokes a pack a day for the past 40 years, so now we know that his respiratory tract, which in the normal individual is lined with epithelial cells, and these epithelial cells have cilia on the top of them, and then the cilia are covered with mucus. The cilia beat up all the mucus to the top of the throat, and they help clear out any bad bacteria from the nose that could have gotten in there or anything else you could have breathed in through your respiratory tract. However, he's a smoker, so he's definitely damaged his ciliary tract, and this is why long-term smokers cough so freaking much because they have to cough up all those extra secretions 
In addition, he has the flu, which is known to impair the cilia's function or the mucociliary escalator as well. So his cilia is basically shot, guys. So he smokes a chimney, he's 65 years old, and he's also had a prior stroke with some secondary dysphagia, and he's on chronic steroids for rheumatoid arthritis. Now, while he goes to sleep, he micro-aspirates some of his nasal pharyngeal secretions into his trachea because he can't swallow that well after he had a stroke. And in those secretions, there's some streptococcus pneumoniae. And since he's on chronic steroids and he's immunosuppressed, when the streptococcus pneumonia gets in down to the bottom of his lungs, his host defenses fail and the bacteria replicates and he has a secondary pneumonia. Another type of pneumonia that can occur is a mixed viral and bacterial pneumonia. They can present with a gradual progression of their illness or they might get better at first, then they'll get worse. They will also have evidence of pulmonary infiltrates or overt consolidation on chest x-ray. So a quick review, guys. You can remember the multiple complications of influenza that can occur by the mnemonic Crocs, like the shoe. It's spelled C-R-O-C-S, where the first C stands for cardiac complications. The R stands for rhabdomyolysis and myositis. The O stands for other rare complications, such as toxic shock syndrome. And the last C stands for central nervous system complications. And the S stands for a secondary pneumonia, which remember guys, is by far going to be the most common secondary complication seen. Well, that's everything we're gonna talk about today. While the flu is mainly a self-limiting upper respiratory infection, it kills people every year and it has the potential to cause numerous complications, especially in those high-risk individuals. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.